Good afternoon. I'm Denver Police Chief Ron Thomas. I'm here with uh, Major Crimes Division Commander Matt Clark, uh, here to provide a much more in-depth uh, briefing on a critical incident that happened a week ago Sunday, um, uh, during which uh, two of our, or three of our officers um, were engaged in a critical incident with an individual that they encountered as a result of a call for service. Um, before I turn it over to Commander Clark, I do want to acknowledge the tragedy of the death and also our significant regret at the fact that despite um, significant efforts to try to identify next of kin, we've not been able to make a family notification as we would have liked. And so those efforts will continue, but we do regret the fact that we have not been able to do that just yet. So, Matt. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Matt Clark, the commander of the D Major Crimes Division for the Denver Police Department. I uh, appreciate you being here today and giving us an opportunity to provide an uh, update on the incident that occurred on Sunday, June 16, 2024, around 11.55 in the morning near Broadway and Lawrence. At this point, this is intended to be a follow-up briefing based upon the information that we've gathered through talking to numerous witnesses, speaking with the involved officers, and analyzing evidence that was collected at the scene. Uh, there may be information that I do not know, uh, I don't have access to or can't disclose at this point, but to the degree we're able to, I'll answer any questions uh, after we go over the narrative of the incident. On Sunday, June 16, 2024, between 11.35 and 11.45, the Denver Communication Center received three calls reporting a person was standing in the intersection of Broadway and Lawrence Street. The callers reported the individual was yelling and creating a hazard for passing vehicles. One caller advised the subject was yelling at passing motorists to kill them. At 11.45, a Denver Park Ranger who was in the area of Broadway and Lawrence observed the same individual in the intersection. The Ranger had a Denver police radio and communicated their observations directly with the police dispatcher and responding officers. The Ranger reported the person was refusing to get out of the road and advised officers the subject had a knife with an 8-inch blade in a bag. Uniformed patrol officers quickly responded to the area and located the person in the middle of the intersection of Broadway and Lawrence Street. This location is a busy intersection with heavy vehicle and pedestrian traffic. When the officers arrived, the subject was carrying several bags but did not have a weapon in their hand. The officers could see the handle of what appeared to be a large knife in a bag that the person was wearing over their shoulder. The uniformed officers positioned their marked police vehicles in the intersection in a manner that diverted traffic and partially contained the individual so others in the area would be protected. The officers worked to communicate with the individual by speaking in both English and Spanish. An officer also visually demonstrated that he wanted the person to put their hands on their head. This was all done in an effort to de-escalate the situation and gain the subject voluntary compliance. The subject did not comply with the officer's direction and instead retrieved the large knife from the over-the-shoulder over bag they were wearing. The subject held the knife in their right hand uh, while pointing it, uh, the point of the knife directed directly at the officers. One officer had previously drawn his taser, and upon seeing the subject with the knife, the officer deployed the taser at the subject. The taser device appeared to have a very brief impact, but was not effective in stopping the subject's intentional movement towards the officers. When it was clear the subject was not incapacitated by the initial taser deployment, the same officer deployed a second cartridge from their taser. At the same time, a second officer deployed their taser. Neither of these subsequent deployments stopped the subject's movements towards the officers. The subject continued to advance on the uniformed officers while holding the knife as they backed up to create distance from the individual. Recognizing the tasers were not effective in stopping the subject, both officers transitioned from their taser devices to their duty handguns. In fearing the individual would attack them with the knife, both officers discharged their firearms multiple times. Just prior to this, a uniformed patrol sergeant, who's a supervisor, arrived at the intersection. The, sar the, su excuse me, the sergeant observed the subject advancing towards the officers with the knife and feared they would be stabbed. The sergeant discharged his duty handgun multiple times. The subject was struck and fell to the ground. Officers uh, attended to the individual, handcuffed the subject, and rolled them over uh, to attempt to render aid. An ambulance was summoned to the scene and quickly arrived. The subject was assessed by paramedics and was pronounced de deceased at the scene. The Denver officer of the medical examiner has identified the individual as 52-year-old Miguel Tapia. At the scene, detectives recovered a knife with a blade that was approximately seven inches long. 
This was the object the subject held in their hand while advancing on the officers. Investigators determined the three Denver police officers fired a combined total of 12 rounds from their duty handgun. These rounds were all fired in approximately two seconds. Two taser devices were recovered at the scene. An analysis of each taser indicated one taser discharged twice and the other taser was deployed one time. While the first taser deployment appears to have briefly been effective, it was clear the subject was not incapacitated as they continued aggressively moving towards the officers. The two subsequent taser deployments were not effective in stopping the individual. The officers who discharged their weapons were uniformed patrol officers assigned to Patrol District 6 downtown. Two officers were uniformed officers, uh, one who was, began with the department in 2018 and the other who started in 2022. Neither of these officers has been involved in a prior police shooting. The other uniformed officer on scene holds the rank of sergeant, which is a first line supervisor in the district. Uh, that officer started with the department in 2001. The sergeant has not been involved in a prior police shooting incident. The body worn cameras uh, that were issued to the officers were activated and captured their interaction with the subject as well, including the shooting. And the officers will be on a modified duty status as they complete the department's reintegration program. As in any critical in incident investigation, uh, we work cooperatively, uh, and this is being conducted by the Colorado Bureau of Investigations, the Colorado State Patrol, Denver Police Department's Homicide Unit, and the Denver District Attorney's Office. All of these investigations are overseen by the Office of the Independent Monitor. Through the course of the investigation, we spoke with a number of people who were in the area. We know there were many others who were also present. Uh, so I would encourage anyone who has information about this incident, anyone who has video of this incident, to contact the Denver Police Department, and that can be done directly through our non-emergency dispatch or through Crime Stoppers at 720-913-STOP. I'll briefly um, show some slides, some screenshots from the officer's body-worn camera, as well as the uh, knife that the subject possessed. Uh, this is one of the first uh, interactions they had. They're uh, only several seconds into their contact. Uh, this officer has a taser pointed at the individual, and the individual is uh, retrieving, pulling out that knife uh, from the bag, the shoulder bag that they uh, had that was on the front side. The next slide is, uh, shows the proximity of the officers. Uh, the individual now is pointing the, the knife in an upward manner. Both officers that are uh, in frame here have uh, taser devices. The yellow uh, objects in their hands are their, their uh, department-issued tasers. Uh, this is the officer who was on the right previously, uh, and as the individual is making progress towards the officers with the knife pointed in an outward uh, manner towards the officers and an officer pointing a taser at the individual. Again, just the subject continuing uh, to advance on the officers, the officers moving back away from their patrol cars in an effort to create distance from the subject. And this is just prior to the shot being fired. This was a knife that the investigators and crime scene personnel recovered from the scene. Uh, it was, the officers were able to see the uh, handle of it and recognize that to be uh, the knife and that ultimately was what the individual pulled out. Uh, and pointed towards the officers as they walked towards them. Can now address any questions. Uh, Commander, do we know why the taser deployments did not work? And could you talk about the department policy um, when that happened? So there's a number of reasons uh, that would cause a taser potentially not to work. They, they work in a number of situations. Uh, these officers themselves have had successful taser deployments in the past with those devices. Uh, there are, as we look at how a taser functions, it, it shoots two probes out. Uh, both probes have to connect. And not only do they have to connect to the, to the person, they actually have to connect to skin. Uh, it can't just be clothing. And sometimes we uh, lose taser probes in bulky clothing. Sometimes a taser probe, as these are, are discharged, they will spread and we will miss on a taser, uh, one of the probes. Uh, each of the devices that our officers carry have the ability to, to fire two cartridges. There's two cartridges in each taser. So the individual officer had one, he recognized, and you'll notice from the video a brief kind of um, uh, tensing, I, I would describe it as, uh, and then that stops. So there's a couple reasons. Either a probe became dislodged, 
Um, there was movement that that didn't have it no it was no longer connected to skin potentially, uh, and so they deployed immediately without having to transition or come off uh, with that similar device. Uh, were able to deploy the second cartridge. The other officer was in a close position. We were within range. The range of those cartridges is 22 feet, so we were well within uh, the range for those they, that could have been effective. Um, but there's a number of things outside of the probes. Sometimes narcotics. Um, sometimes the the spread of the probes and the ability to conduct uh, to to deliver the the electricity to them to stop them uh, isn't there. So it's, it's certainly something we're considering. Uh, the officers, in terms of uh, training, it's it's certainly a device to to stop a subject. But as this individual is advancing with that edge weapon, uh, they tran transition to their duty firearms. Is there toxicology? There will be at some point. The Denver Office of the Medical Examiner will release that with the autopsy findings. Uh, typically, we're seeing about 10 weeks on that. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the, I couldn't hear very well. One of the callers said something about saying that said they were going to kill someone. What, what was that? No, the, the callers, the three callers indicated there was a, ha a hazard in the roadway, but one of the callers heard the individual saying, hit me, as if they wanted a vehicle to hit them. And so was there a mental health professional considered to come on this call? You want to take it? Uh, I can address that question. So certainly we do have uh, both the star van and, and co-responders that are riding with officers. This would not have been a call that would have been appropriate for a star response because of the, the presence of a weapon, because there's an opportunity for violence. So this is not a, a call that would have been appropriate for a star response. Had there been a co-responder available and nearby, um, Certainly there, there might have been an opportunity for them to intervene some kind of way, but I think the urgency with you know, getting someone there to get this person out of the roadway and then obviously the presence of the knife, I think that it was important for the nearest available officers to respond. And so, um, so that's, that's how we dealt with that situation. I, I would, you know, uh, certainly uh, we have discovered that the person was transgendered and, and there is a belief that the person was houseless, um, but that did not factor into our decision. I mean, what factored into our decision was the person had a knife and was moving aggressively towards the officers. They tried, I think, in vain to, to stop them through less lethal means and then had to transition to, to a lethal option when that was not, uh, when that didn't work. I don't think that that's something that we'll ever actually know. Um, I think that uh, th there is something that uh, that is said in Spanish uh, to the officers, uh, something uh, I, I think translated to, to mean kill me. Um, so I think that one might assume that, that they were uh, that they were asking to be killed, but um, I don't know that that's something that we'll ever know. I don't think that we'll ever know what um, their desire was in that situation. But certainly the presence of the knife, uh, the proximity that that individual got to those officers with the knife, um, I think makes their, their response appropriate. Okay, so where does this go from here? What happens now with mm -hmm. investigations mm -hmm. and further action? Yes, so, um, so um, they will complete their investigation. I think much of that is already done you know, by our uh, team as well as uh, CBI and the State Patrol. Um, the Office of the Independent Monitor has monitored the entire uh, operation, and the, that completed investigation will be turned over to the Denver District Attorney. Do you know which countries have either came from and how long they've been here? We don't. We're still working to, to uh, get a, a good understanding of, of where, where he was from. I don't know. Is he the right person? I apologize. Where they were from. I, I know you said Mr. Tapia, so I just responded, but where they were from. It, it took you two or three minutes to carefully explain what went down, but if I was watching it correctly, the whole thing was over in 15 or 20 seconds. So what's it, what's it like for those those individuals to have to cope with all of that in such a very fast time frame? Well, it did happen very quickly. As you see, within 10 seconds of 
of, of the initial interaction, the tasers are deployed. Several seconds later, uh, there's gunshots being fired. So uh, they responded immediately in transition, and as, as the situation evolved, what was presented to them, uh, they, they responded to that. Uh, in the video, after they get the knife out of the way, you see one of the officers kind of like grab something else out of the person's hand. Do you guys know what that was? It's like a toy or something? I don't recall specifically. I'm curious about the tasers. Do you have the evidence? I mean, obviously, post-mortem, you've got evidence of whether the tasers connected or not. Do you, do you know if the tasers did not connect? Or? So I'm not sure we'll, we'll be able to specifically know. The tasers are... Uh, are able to offload a significant amount of information for us to, to analyze, and that's why we're able to uh, conclude that there was some contact. And then I can visually look at the uh, at the the video that was captured by the body worn cameras and see that tensing of the muscles, which you would expect from the taser. But I'm not sure what happened that caused that to stop uh, being effective. And and we do have evidence that there was that the probes uh, were discharged. Uh, maybe even made contact with clothing, but I don't know to what degree they were in contact with the subject's skin. And how many tasers were shot? Two devices. One was shot twice because it has two cartridges in it, and the other was shot one time. Okay. So three three deployments of the taser were activated. Chief, you said you have some difficulties uh, finding next to kin. Is that because you don't know who they are, or you have names and just haven't been able to find any? Maybe want to address that. Yeah, so... Ooh. We have, uh, we're generally very successful in locating people, uh, family members, friends who can connect us with uh, family members in these situations. The medical examiner's team uh, has been working diligently. We've worked with our crisis services team and then similarly the homicide investigators in the police department. Um, and despite all of our efforts, haven't been able to locate people who are associated with this individual and, and even friends that we can, can make those connections with. So um, it has been uh, concerning. We want to have the conversations with them and, and talk through these incidents and share uh, the information that we have to this point but haven't been able to. Do you know if the person spoke, and spoke English at a certain point or always Spanish? My understanding, I, I'm only, I only specifically heard the Spanish. Um, so I'm not sure if there was other, what the fluency in English was. So that person always is spoken in Spanish? In the brief interaction we had with officers, yes. And the officer that interacted was a fluent Spanish speaker himself. Both officers, I think both officers at least, uh, acknowledged the body-worn cameras in the clip. Do you want to just talk to what role those played in the actions, reviewing the actions, reviewing what happened for you guys? Well, certainly the body-worn camera provides a, a really close view in most circumstances of what's happening. The, the way the department implements them is the audio is recorded, and audio and video is recorded 30 seconds prior to uh, an officer, officer activating. So once they activate, we go capture that buffer and have that available. And, and that's uh, sometimes a front row seat to what's happening uh, in seeing exactly what the officer's actions are, what the proximity to the uh, uh, individual is, and what the uh, individual's actions are. Now, there are things to be cautious of as we deal with body-worn cameras. Specifically, it may not capture uh, what the officer perceives, and if the officer is looking a different direction than the, than the camera's pointed, we may or may not capture um, something that was recognized by the officer in the incident as well. I'm not aware that they were. With the uncertainty around this individual, how were you able to identify them? Uh, the medical examiner is responsible for that identification, and they provided it back. Uh, my understanding it was was through fingerprint identification, though. Were they a prior arrest? Then? I don't know about that specifically uh, and how, because a fingerprint doesn't necessarily have to come from an arrest record. So we don't address uh, prior criminal histories uh, in these scenarios. So it may be um, a person coming from another country, I mean, like uh, illegal? It's possible, but we haven't verified that either. Uh, isn't his arrest record uh, of public information? It is, and we, you have uh, the information to go ahead and, and retrieve that through other sources. Could you spell the name? Uh, the name that he's been identified as is, uh, excuse me, the individual is, is Miguel, M-I-G-U-E-L, Tapia, T-A-P-I-A. -A. Uh, 
uh, March 7th, 1972.